Yeah, I I genuinely believe that the net impact of AI is going to be, excuse me, it's going to be hugely positive. Mm. So it definitely is going to create new jobs. It's going to make new things possible that were impossible in the past. We're going through something absolutely historic. Technologies across the board are growing exponentially. It's a disruption that's going to completely redefine the way businesses compete. In the next decade, we're going to lose 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies. The exponential growth of computing is continuing. AI is nowhere near its full potential. Whether you like it or not, that the future cannot be stopped by anyone. Hello again, everybody. This is Mark Verbenkoff, and welcome to the Future Tech and Foresight podcast. This is going to be episode number 132. And once again, we're going to be focusing on artificial intelligence, of course. Um, so as AI kind of continues to advance, uh, one of the things that I recently became aware of, um, which is a critical but often overlooked aspect that comes into play is something called AI labeling, often known as human input. So this actually is a vital cog in the machine of AI development, and we'll be diving into it a little bit deeper uh, in today's episode. So AI labeling isn't just a technical process, though. It is actually a massively growing industry. It's worth about five billion US dollars today, expected to be about 15 billion by 2030 but only a fifth of its potential market is actually currently tapped, which of course leaves an expansive room for growth, innovation, and of course opportunities. So it's a field that's uh, not also just fueling the AI revolution, but also a significant contributor to job creation in the tech world itself. And um, we'll be diving into that a little bit later on in today's episode. So joining me today, I'm very happy to have Ahmed Rashad, the CEO of Sapien.io, who will dive into the world of AI labeling, how it's of course fundamental to the continued growth of AI, and of course, some of the challenges that the industry is facing. Ahmed will also shed some light on the cutting edge work happening over at Sapien.io and share his vision for the future of data labeling, the future of jobs, and AI in general. So I hope that you enjoyed the episode as much as I enjoyed discussing and talking with Ahmed about AI and all of these kind of wacky things that have been coming out uh, over the last, well, several years, but most notably over the last year. All right. Hi there, Ahmed. Well, thank you very much for coming to the podcast today to talk about what seems to be kind of taking over the podcast, uh, AI, especially over the last year, which obviously everybody's interested in. So thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Awesome. Uh, well, as I just mentioned to you, uh, the first question that I ask every guest is, what made you initially get interested in the work that you're doing? We're obviously going to be talking about AI today. So was there an initial spark or was it kind of just, you know, continuous exposure to the awesomeness of AI that got you interested in the space? <laughs> I, I, I wish there was uh, I wish there was a uh, an, an, an inspiring story arc with uh, with a, with a whole lot of twists and turns. But uh, quite frankly, it was uh, <laughs> it was uh, serendipity. It was uh, pure luck and coincidence. Um, it was actually uh, I, I was I was interested, but didn't didn't get too deep into it. I'd read about it. I'd uh, try a few things, and then uh, while at Amazon, I uh, I was working on a project that. The obvious solution to a lot of the problems we had was AI, mm. and uh, that's the, that's usually how I get really interested in things. Uh, I have a problem, I try to solve it, and uh, I find uh, a, a nice tool or approach, and I get super interested. And all of a sudden, this is what I do day in day out. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and um, so, how many years ago was that? That was twenty eighteen. So okay. Okay. Um, yeah, five years ago. Five years ago. And um, so like, I'm, I'm obviously curious and excited about the whole AI space, but I'm a little bit on the outskirts of it. I'm not, it's not my day-to-day uh, -day job, right? I'm not focused on it every single day. How have you seen the AI space change? Are there any like, obviously ChatGPT and generative AI is kind of this new buzzword that everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, maybe apart from that, have you seen any like 
really interesting innovations or changes in the last, I guess it's about five years now, coming on to six years since you've been in the space that, uh, that you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are, there are, there are actually three, three main things that are very interesting to note. One is um, <clears throat> how early AI actually started. Uh, but the naming was different. So it wasn't called artificial intelligence. It was called a bunch of other things, depending on the application. And, and then it started evolving and the naming started evolving and it started catching on. And uh, the second thing, so of course, how, how early how early was uh, it was there? And two is uh, how much of our day-to-day -day interactions, whether at work or personally, uh, are actually supported and enhanced and made better with AI uh, it's it's in it's in a lot of things that um, we we don't think about every day. So even even some of the companies that you would get a loan from, they use AI to validate whether you can pay back the loan or not. Right. It it, it, it goes in everywhere. And the third is the speed of of evolution, the speed of growth of AI. Um, it's it, it it's it's unbelievable. And every time you think, well, where will it go next? And and then you find 10 more things that it's just going into. And each one of those things opens 10 more things. And it's just growing logarithmically. And it's 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 unbelievable. Yeah, um, that's certainly my experience from, as I said, kind of the peripheries of this of this whole uh, ecosystem. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, I think we want to maybe save that to the end. That's definitely um, something that we should get into, especially as the name of the podcast is, you know, future tech and foresight, <laughs> yes. right? Looking for the next five to 10 years and what's going to what's going to be happening. Um, one of the things I also have lots of conversations with people about AI, both people that are very familiar with the technology in the space and those that are not. Mm -hmm. But the and I'm sure you have the the same issue. The one of the main topics that comes around all the time is, well, how is this going to impact work? Is it going to eliminate all jobs? Um, is it going to generate new jobs, like create new jobs? Uh, is it going to, you know, modify or change jobs? Maybe just um, can get your quick perspective on that before we dive into kind of the the meat of of today's discussion. Yeah, I I genuinely believe that the net impact of AI is going to be, excuse me, it's going to be hugely positive. So it definitely is going to create new jobs. It's going to make new things possible that were impossible in the past. So think about a good analogy is the automotive industry. While we were all worried about, well, not us, but it was before, before my time, I'm not at all. <laughs> but uh, people were worried, well, what's going to happen to the, uh, to the horse and carriage industry? What's going to happen to yeah. horses and the horse breeders and so on and so forth? And, and yes, yes, it did. It probably did impact people who chose to continue in that uh, in that space. It didn't impact them very positively, but it did open up a whole set of new jobs and new opportunities that weren't there before, including second and third and fourth order effective things. Mm. So just because of the automotive industry, all of a sudden transportation became much more accessible. So all of a sudden it opened up other industries and made them more reach, be able to reach more people. It opened up new options. A whole new industries. I mean, Uber wouldn't be here if it weren't for right. that uh, for that first part, right? Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a very uh, optimistic outlook uh, when you when you look at it historically. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It it it, it, it in aggregate, it's massively positive. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are there might be very small pockets that that might not be positive right now, mm -hmm. or might even be negative right now. But it doesn't mean it's it's negative overall. Yeah. Yeah. O overall. Yeah. That, that's a, I like that way of thinking about it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay, great. Uh, so we are going to be focusing a little bit on data labeling today. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, as somebody that's a little bit on the periphery, I was, I mean, I'm obviously aware of it, but maybe not as much uh, as I should be. Could you kind of give a uh, bird's eye view of, of what data labeling is and why it's important specifically for, for AI? Yeah, absolutely. So, so in in general, there are there are different types of you have to teach them. You have to teach AI. You have to teach the model. Uh, you have to give it a bunch of inputs. You have to teach it. You have to make it learn mm -hmm. so that it can produce a certain output. Now, there are there are several ways of teaching it. Some of it's called unsupervised. Basically, the machine is basically teaching itself. You just if you the parameters, and then there is semi supervised and, and supervised. Mm -hmm. What that means basically is that you need some form at some level, human input 
into uh, data that gets fed into the model, telling it what is what. Uh, and by the way, I, I generally don't like the term data labeling. I, I prefer to call it human input or human feedback because it's 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 more specific. It's actually what what happens is humans are giving feedback into the model or this type of data labeling school. Humans giving feedback into the model, and basically, let's say you're developing something for an autonomous vehicle. Before the vehicle can recognize that this is a person, this is this is a lane line, this is a traffic sign, and so on, someone needs to go in and keep telling it, this is a person, so is that, so is that. So the next person, the next time it sees something, it hasn't seen the same person before, not with the same conditions. When it sees it, it has so many examples of persons that it can say, this object that I detected is most likely a person. Mm -hmm. And that is daily labeling. It applies to everything else, uh, LLMs, text-based, vision, audio, video, whatever. It's yeah. the same. Concept. Right. Yeah, I remember hearing about, uh, I think the earliest examples that I heard about were like trying to teach AI what a cat and a dog is, right? And the distinction between those two. Uh, sometimes it would say, well, that's a cat, but it's actually a dog and, and vice versa. So I think there was, <laughs> I think there was, maybe there's like some, crowdsourcing uh project that happened where you know thousands of people were saying this is a dog this is a cat or whatever and it was fed into the uh into the air. and I, I think this is kind of what we're talking about today or something connected to it right this is this is exactly it yeah. this is this is perfectly it okay awesome so um i can i can start to picture some of the challenges or problems if data labeling is done incorrectly uh, and I'm sure mm -hmm. some of the some of the audience is thinking about that too. Could you talk to us about the problems that happens if data label, data labeling or human input, as you like to say, uh, isn't done correctly? It yeah, it 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 can be very very problematic because uh, it, this is one of the prime examples of garbage in garbage out. So mm -hmm. let's say you keep consistently, and let's take this example, you keep consistently telling uh, your model that. Um, the cat is is actually a non-object that moves for, for an autonomous vehicle. The cat's a non-object that moves. It's, it's a stationary object. The model will keep, whenever it sees a cat, it's going to assume it's a stationary object and it's going to behave based on that. And it's going to make decisions on the car on the driving based on that. Mm. Now the cat moves and the model doesn't respond the right way, the way you want it to. It can be very problematic depending on the use case. Uh, in the least, in the way that's least negative, you, you will see the model hallucinating or giving you bad outputs or you ask it uh, what day it is today and it'll tell you blue or something along those lines, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> right? So, but, but, but uh, of course, because of what we use AI in, it could have some serious negative implications. Right. So it needs uh, to be done right, it needs to be done consistently and it needs to be done in large volumes. Right, right. Um... Okay, so my next question connected to that is, as the pace of AI is, as you said at the kind of top of the show, um, exponential, it's, it's just massive. I would also assume that the pace of this data labeling has to be pretty significant, if not even more, um, for the AI algorithms to actually learn. Is there any concern about the pace of this human input, this, this labeling slowing down? Um, and if it does slow down, does it just completely slow down the whole AI industry? Yeah, yeah, uh, you're 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 spot on. I mean, the it's actually what we see in the in the in the in the market today in the AI industry today that a lot of people, because of the lack of access to good, high quality, high volume, scalable data labeling. Uh, are trying to find alternatives and they're trying to find alternatives and it always comes back to, okay, here's an incremental improvement, but it still doesn't solve the problem, which is I need good high quality data labeling or human input mm -hmm. into uh, into my models. Uh, it is definitely slowing a lot of people down. Um, it is also leading to some other interesting developments such as uh, synthetic data models, labeling, labeling, labeling the data for you, simpler other models, labeling parts of the data for you and so on and so forth. But it doesn't completely solve the problem because the demand for data labeling is growing just as fast as the demand for AI is growing. Mm -hmm. Even if you solve a small fraction of it, you still have a huge amount part of the problem that's just unsolved. Right. Hmm, interesting. 
Uh, and and are there current initiatives out there? I mean, we'll obviously be talking about about your organization. In a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but before jumping the gun, uh, are there are there current um, maybe not competitors, but you know ways or processes or like large government organizations that are trying to do this, or is this just so dependent on the private market uh, and the individual organizations that are building AI for this to happen? Yeah, yeah. So, so unfortunately, the uh, the options that are that people fa- that people have today, I think, are are kind of suboptimal because you have one of three options. You can either go in and set up your own labeling operation, which is quite expensive. It's quite a hassle. You need to hire people, uh, and guess what? You have whatever hundred people, and your volume. You need to double the volume next week. You're not going to hire another hundred and then let it go. It's not going to work. You're just going to slow down. Plus, it's expensive, and it's uh, it, it takes quite a bit of management overhead, and it's 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 quite a bit of ass. The other option is to find contractors to do it on your behalf, and this is quite difficult to do. The quality is usually not great, and uh, it's also quite expensive. And uh, did I say it's a pain to deal with? <laughs> I should say that three times because it's very painful. <laughs> And then the third option is to go to one of the existing companies that are competent and capable of taking on volume. But these folks are these folks have are facing challenges of their own, uh, including things like scaling. And it's it's not easy to scale such an operation. And which actually leads me to to the evolution of of that that the tasks themselves have gotten more and more complex. And this is why this problem is getting more and more intense. So even the existing options that you have, they are their feasibility is, is declining in a lot of ways. So so it's, it's all shrinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I could I could imagine, and maybe you can give an example of this, right? So uh, I don't know how many years ago. Let's say let's say six seven years ago, it was you know dog and cat. That was what the labeling problem was. Now I'm assuming it's something a little bit more complex than dog versus cat. Could you um, could you give an example to to make it a little bit more tangible for us? Yeah, absolutely. So one 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 example actually is uh, from uh, from autonomous vehicles. And mm-hmm. uh, five five six years ago, um, you needed humans to go in and label and identify and put tags on every object on in a scene. Uh, including this is a person, this is a this is a cat, this is a, uh, a sidewalk, and so on and so forth. Well, now you see uh, you see the autonomous vehicles actually running on the road, and they're they're doing well in places like San Francisco and Austin and Vegas and so on, Phoenix and so on and so forth. The problem today has has evolved in a couple of ways. One, the output has become more objective. Uh, sorry, more subjective. So, for example, how does this statement make you feel? Mm. right or which one of these do you prefer and why right and the other piece of complexity is just simple use cases that are inherently complex such as uh, one of the cases we're working on right now is detection of pancreatic cancer which as you can imagine required very very specialized skill set uh it's not a clear-cut answer in about 15 percent of 15 percent of the time it's not a clear-cut answer um, it's a whole lot of maybes and ifs, and I need more data and and all of that. And also, it's a lot of data that you need to ingest collectively, identify and analyze individually, and then collectively, and then make a call. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's 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 quite complex. Yeah, and I can also imagine that again, cat and dog, anybody can tell the difference. Pancreatic cancer, not everybody can tell the difference. So you need oh, to highly specialized people in order to help train. Or, or in order to uh, to give the yeah. human input, which actually leads to the problem of scarcity and scaling, because how can you get doctors to actually do this? Yeah, yeah. So it becomes well, a very complex well, problem. Go ahead. What, what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there there are a few answers, and the answer the answer for for us. And, and by the way, so so we're at Sapien. We're trying to solve this problem of scalability, while not increasing costs. Actually, while bringing costs uh, down quite a bit. And the way we thought about it, we instead of going down the traditional approach of building a great tool and or uh, building something that solves a um, that solves a specific use case we thought okay we're going to do that but we're going to do it with the lens of the human the person actually doing the labeling the person doing the tagging the person providing your feedback and input and once we started doing that all the problems started to the solutions to the problems started to become clearer and clearer 
And it always came back to complexity. So we're solving for complexity. And the way we solve for it is we basically take any task, break it down to the most atomic level components it can be broken down to. And surprise, surprise, once you break down enough tasks, you have, you have a library of components that later on, doesn't matter what task comes in, you just mix and match those tasks, build them up like Lego pieces, which can be automated, by the way. And, uh, and you have your new task. And it, it really, uh, re really removed multiple layers of complexity that allowed us to, uh, if there's a cat or a dog component, I can do that automatically with models. Uh, I can write code to, to automate large parts of it. And I don't need to send the entire thing to a doctor who understands pancreatic cancer. I can send bits and pieces of it to other people. And then I can send only the really, really difficult parts to the really, really, really scaled people. So I end up scaling up because my most scarce resources now can touch 10 analysis, 10 diagnoses in the same time it would normally take them to touch one. Hmm. Oh, and, and it's much cheaper too. <laughs> it kind of works out for everyone. So. Right, right. Um, yeah, so th that definitely sounds like it's uh, able to scale up. Is it, is it, um, is it able to scale up to the to the level that's needed for the amount of AI uh, human input required nowadays because of the market moving so quickly? Yeah. So, so every new use case, the, the the way I think about it, and the short answer is yes, but the way I think about it is. Every use case, every complexity comes either from one of two things, either by adding components on top of it, and we already have the components, so we can just add more components on top of it. It's not a problem. It's, it's already, you can also break it down, or a novel requirement that comes in. And for each one of those new novel requirements, like what's your opinion on this color, right? Mm -hmm. Then we can build a new set of modules that address this new set of components. And it just gets added to the library. So, so it, it's in a, in a lot of ways, this is as future proof as it gets because it's broken down to the finest components possible, the smallest components possible. And everything new is mostly going to be a, comp a combination, one or, one or more of these combinations. Okay, interesting. Um, without giving away too many secrets of your, of your organization, could you maybe run us through an example? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so this is this is a um, this is a simplified example. Yeah. So, um, from a wildlife, one of our wildlife customers, and, and this is a simplified example. So, they have these trail cams set up that capture uh, video, and they want to track motion and activity and behavior of all the wildlife that live on the on on the uh, on the in the in the, in the park. Mm -hmm. So, for them to be able to do that, they need to identify. Uh, first part is which we're going to focus on. They need to identify each animal and bird and creature that that's there, along with the species, subspecies, uh, age, gender, and a couple of other attributes. So the way we break it down is okay. Each one of those components, we're going to break those down, and the first the first component is identifying an object. So you have a scene with a deer and a bear and a couple of raccoons and a few rabbits. So the first part of it is identifying objects. That's a component. Identify objects in the scene. So if someone goes in and literally taps, 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 here are all the objects. The second part is someone who can tell the difference between the different types of, that, that understands this type of, the types of creatures that exist here. And the person would go and say, deer, bear, uh, rabbit, rabbit, raccoon, uh, bird. And now I understand that there are deer, bears, birds, raccoons, and so on. Now I can start the, spreading it out to people who understand each one of those creatures. And then the person can go in and say, this deer, this is white tail, male, adult. This bear is black bear, juvenile, female, right. and so on. Right. So, uh, and then, of course, there's uh, there's a component, to other, another component where you have to actually draw a box around the creature itself. But... Uh, Another simplification as well is we have these large scenes, but once you've identified that there's a bear in this area, uh, you crop the image. So I don't need the whole image. So I crop the image and all of a sudden you don't need this whole two gigabyte image. You need just a tiny component of it, which reduces bandwidth, which allows you to do it on mobile, uh, which, which makes it way easier and way less distracting. And you don't have to do many steps. You just have to do one step. 
Just mm. tap on tap on, tap on the creatures. Okay, here's one. Find Waldo, right? Second one. Hey, here's a bear. We know this is a bear. Draw a box around. Here, done. Right? And then it goes someone who's like, what kind of bear is this? Black bear. Good. Next one. <laughs> Male right. or female? How old? <laughs> Right. So it's broken down and a person could do one or more of the tasks, depending on their preference and, and how we see them perform. So uh, we know the strengths that some people perform really, really well with repetitive tasks with some variability. So I send them, OK, what type of bear is this? And, and I just keep sending them bears. And every now and then I inject a few deers in just to not keep it too monotonous. Mm -hmm. monotonous. And, and then for others, they want the diversity because that's what keeps them active. And we notice those trends. We see them from our from, from from our metadata, and we see where people start doing well and start not doing well. So so it, think of it like a YouTube algorithm, how it feeds you the yeah. next videos. It, it's it's kind of the same. That's super interesting. That's super interesting. Um, uh, I I think the next question here, and yeah, the, how do you find these people? Like, are these people that are already involved in, say, for this wilderness park, are they involved in the park already? Is, is there like a network that you tap into? Are there people that are just, hey, I'm curious about, you know, helping AI move forward and I'm kind of a volunteer? Because uh, I would assume that that might be a bit of a challenge to to get these people to to, to help give this human input. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. It's actually impacted, I, I would think, a lot of economies <laughs> in very interesting and in good ways. Mm. Um, so this goes back to my time at uh, at Scale AI and then advising between uh, the time when I was advising uh, others between uh, Scale AI and Sapien. And uh, during the time at Scale AI, uh, we managed to recruit uh, a little over a million people to actually do their labor. So and and this started from from a very very small number, like a very very small number. Uh, and we expanded operations uh, across 72 countries. I was leading uh, operations and growth at the time. And we I just had to build those networks. I had to understand those networks. I had to understand how to go into a new country, how to set up those connections, how to, how to find people, how to set up referrals, how to do all of those things. And frankly, since that time, we had to grow and we had to recruit people at a scale never, never seen before for this industry. So we know how to do it. Uh, we don't do it really well, and uh, beyond that, the biggest the biggest recruiting mechanism is treat people well, mm. treat people fairly, treat them well, and big surprise, they start getting their friends and their and their family and their cousins and their neighbors and so on because everyone's interested in this thing. People want to do good work; they just want the opportunity to do it. And if you treat them, you treat people well. You treat you you pay them what they what they what they deserve. You treat them with respect. And all of a sudden, they want to stay and they want to bring the other people they care about. Right. And so, so we haven't so, run into any problems acquiring people so far. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. And and maybe you could touch a little bit on the the payment mechanism, right? Because it's like my my initial thought is okay. This cat and dog example. I remember hearing some like I can't remember what what it was. Some NGO was using volunteers to do that. And even before that, it was uh, I think it was training the captchas, right? The the security captchas mm -hmm. on the on the different kind of what is it like bikes versus cars versus you know traffic lights and stuff like that and they had some some large like i think quite a large scale um project to have people also identify those things that would then you know train the captcha um it sounds to me like you guys are doing something uh in, in a different way for the same sort of uh reason uh, could you touch on the the monetary aspect of that? Because I think that's also maybe interesting for maybe some people that are listening that might want to get Yeah, it. absolutely. So so the way we think about it is, uh, first of all, we pay people, right? <laughs> so, so that's a very, we pay people, so that's not, not no volunteer work. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there are a couple, a couple of things I actually want to touch on there. So the way we figure out how much we want to pay people, we, we, we actually know how long each task takes. Mm. And we calculate that if any person gives me 40 hours of work a week, then they should be they should be able to support a family of four. Uh, I'm not saying it's gonna be it's gonna be great, it's gonna be luxurious, but it's gonna be enough to support a family of four. Sure, sure. Uh, it's gonna be enough to support a family of four. And you give me 40 hours, you should be able to support a family of four in the location that you're in. And we go actually to quite a level, high level of granularity to figure out where yeah. you are because 
if we can't say, for example, we can't we can't say uh, Kinshasa. No, Kinshasa is a, it's a big city. Where in Kinshasa? Because it matters. Supporting a family with four in different places is very different, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so, so for example, if you're if you're on the Upper East Side in, in Manhattan, it's very different than if you're in in Brooklyn, right? It, it's not the same, even though it's all New York. Mm -hmm. So, so we figured that out, and that's how we price how much we pay per task. Now, on top of that, there are a couple of, a couple of mechanisms uh, that help people earn more. So because we can assess quality almost on the spot because the tasks are so simple, because we can assess quality almost on the spot most, most of the time. So if we see that you're doing good work, you start earning a multiplier and the multiplier allows you to earn even more per task. Mm. So you start earning more per task if, you're, if you keep doing good work. And the idea there is, why are we fighting against, against our best resource? Let's just align incentives. We need good, consistent quality work. They would, they want to do that. Let's just put the incentive so that both are aligned. And, and this, is, this is what we see happening. And then if someone, let's say someone is using a bot or someone is, is cheating or just spamming or not doing good work, we detect that right away and the multiplier starts going down. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's incredible negative incentive for people to, sp to spam or cheat or do any of those things, which controls quality and ensures super high quality, which helps our customers, which brings in more work, which actually allows us to get more work to more people. And it just is a flywheel that keeps going. Yeah. So it sounds like you've thought about this for a day or two on <laughs> for, uh, about a day and a half. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Give or take. Uh, awesome. So I think this brings up something that has. Uh, so um, I'll start off the, the first hundred episodes of the podcast was really focused on automation and uh, specifically technological unemployment and whether um, not just AI, but any kind of automation systems will eradicate jobs or create jobs kind of as we started out with, um, with the top of the podcast. Um, yeah. wh so what you just said really triggered a lot of the ideas that came up in the first hundred episodes. How I'll stop talking, but how do you think the kind of future of uh the growth of AI specifically with regards to what you're saying is going to shift, mold, transform work. Are we going to be seeing more work like the work that you're describing um, span out across the world in order to train AI? Um, or is this mm -hmm. going to be kind of a one, you know, the next five, 10 years and then, Hey, all the AI has been trained and then people can go back to doing different kind of work. Yeah, that's 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 a very interesting question. So, so it's 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 a system. The relationship isn't linear, right? So, so let's let's break it apart a little bit. The bottom line is this work. I don't think this work is not going to go away. Uh, I think it's going to continue to grow. I think it's going to continue to evolve. And and let me explain why. So the first part is the 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 tasks themselves, the work itself, even in data labeling, is getting more complex. Mm -hmm. which means it's going more towards the, the doctors, it's going more towards people who are more specialized and it's going, moving away from, tell me if this is a dog or a cat. Right, right. If we're doing, what we're, we're doing actually is we're, we're moving the clock back where we're breaking down the tasks into smaller components. So, so we're actually moving away from, from um, instead of 100% needing experts, only five, 10% need experts. And then we're moving the rest of the, of the, of the work back to, uh, to the simpler task, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Or the simpler needs. And because the need for labeling and human input is gonna continue to increase. So actually with the work we, that we're doing, we're allowing both ends to grow, not just one of them. Now, on the in the future, in the future, of course, AI is gonna to continue to develop and, and, and perhaps, yes, some models will need as much human input or human feedback as, uh, as they do today, some models will evolve to the point where they can be trained by other models and the data could be labeled by other models and that's fine. But if history continues to repeat itself for every model that leaves from, from one side of the, of the tub, 10 more start coming out from the other side because of the things that this model enabled or the, the new ideas that it's for. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm still not... 100% sure whether it's uh, creative destruction or technological unemployment. Um, <laughs> it, it, 
right? Like I think I think obviously history shows us it's it's creative destruction. There's continuous um, evolution of jobs, right? Transformation and new jobs coming out. Um, who knows what's going to happen in I don't know even ten years time, twenty years time yeah. for sure. Um, but I think the the interesting thing here when when you're speaking is it sounds to me let's go use the doctor example right they are essentially training their replacements yes and no okay so yes and no so yes in some cases for some in some cases for some of the diagnoses the ai can help but it's mostly acting as a co-pilot hmm. versus a replacement because at the end of the day it's at least today, maybe tomorrow, maybe yeah. tomorrow, maybe in a year, maybe in 10 years, it'll change. But there is this intuition that the doctor has built over 10, 20, 30, 40 years from looking at cases over and over again, reading over and over again. There's this intuition because the science in a lot of cases, the pancreatic cancer case, for example, it, it, it's a lot of it comes down to the doctor's experience and, and how they how they perceive, how, how are they going to go after the treatment? What's the treatment plan going to look like? Right? It's not so prescribed exactly what it is. They can assess additional factors that either are not or cannot be incorporated into the model. Mm. Right. So in, in cases like this, the AI evolves to become a co-pilot to help the doctor be more efficient. Now, there is an argument for this having a negative effect, because if you start using the co-pilot a little too early, you actually don't build the intuition. So where does that leave us? We're like in a little bit of a limbo here. Yes. So. So it's, it's unclear to me how this is going to play out. However, for the existing system, it looks like the co-pilot is going to be something that's going to be incredibly helpful. I wonder how that's going to evolve because again, it's a system. It's not, it's not one input, one output. It's, it's multiple things. Yeah. That's a, that's a fascinating idea. I've, I haven't thought about it for a while now. Like in my own personal experience, like I'm using chat GPT multiple times a day, right? I'm sure, I'm sure you are. And I'm sure many, many people out there. Oh, I know many people are out there are. Um, I consider myself a pretty good writer before chat GPT, right? Like I'm able to, uh, you know, put together a university essay pretty quickly. I now see myself using chat GPT to do those kinds of, let's just say an essay consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, I don't know if I'm starting to see it, but I'm sure if there's some like objective measure, I think that my skills, my writing skills are starting to diminish a little bit. I'm mm -hmm. vastly more productive. I'm able to, you know, churn out one of these essays really quickly or blogs or articles, the things that I write. Um, but is there is there going to be a point where my writing skills, if you will, decrease to such an extent that I'm maybe not even able to prompt ChatGPT well enough to churn out a quality article anymore and i guess this is this is the point that i thought was interesting if if these um doctors are doing more or less the same thing obviously in something a little mm -hmm. bit more important than just some some blog or some article essay being written um is there a point where this intuition that they've built up over you know several decades in the career um and they're then training the the ai algorithms are they, is that intuition going to be lost if they're using this co-pilot too much? Is, I think this is a real question, not just for doctors and, you know, bloggers, yeah. but, but for almost any industry over the next, I don't know, 10, 15 years, pick, pick a date. Um, what are your thoughts on that? No, absolutely. I think, I think it's, I, I, again, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of very difficult to tell. And, and there are, there are a couple of, there are a few possible outcomes or a few possible scenarios. One is that we actually start facing a regression. Yeah. Right, and, and and I think it's it's likely it's possible, uh, if we don't change anything. Right, <laughs> if we don't change anything, we could we could possibly start facing a regression in many fields. The second is, and the regression is negative. The second is we could face a regression. However, we've made enough progress, uh, we've made enough progress, and we've evolved enough that whatever we regressed on is no longer necessary. So, for example. Um, Things like tanning, for example, a tanning for leather. A lot of us don't know how to do it, right? Most of us don't know how to do it. Um, or how to start a fire in, in the wilderness. Like we don't know how to do that either, I, right? Yeah. <laughs> or a, cal a calculator, I think, is the example that comes up in my conversations all the time, right? I, I or a calculator. calculator. Yeah, yeah. So while we, while we retained 
but but th that's actually quite interesting because at least the school I went to, we weren't allowed to use a calculator until I think sixth grade. Sure. Right. So so you build this basic skill to understand how it works, and then you automate parts of it away, and it frees you up to do higher functions. Mm -hmm. So so if you take away the, if you take if you look at the two extremes, one is there's a complete regression and we just collapse, or two. Uh, or two, uh, we just evolve beyond it and it doesn't matter. And then there's something in the middle where we, we actually set some guardrails and discipline around education and development and so on, where you can actually make use of this co-pilot versus it being something that gets in your way, yeah. right? Um, I, I actually faced something like that with, with, with my kids that because they, they, they actually started in school very, very early on. They, they can barely write anymore. They genuinely can 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 track, right? Yeah. And and I think this is where the math versus the writing thing came in, where you start relying on computers so much, you actually you actually don't know how to write anymore. Versus in math, like we we still know how to do arithmetic by hand if we have to. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. I, I mean, this is this is uh, I guess part of the bucket of questions that the general society, you know, people that are deeply immersed in the AI space are, are constantly talking about. And then, you know, people on the fringes get concerned because there's not a, there's not a clear understanding of what's going to happen in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. <laughs> and I think, I think it's that uncertainty that makes people afraid or concerned or, you know, ambivalent, <laughs> uh, yeah. depending on the person's perspective. Yeah. I So, so the, another way I think about it is one of the, one of the best, one of the best ways uh, or one of the most sustainable ways for an economy to grow is by is by increasing efficiency and effectiveness, the productivity per person, and and that's what that's one of the things that creates net gain in economically overall. Mm -hmm. So I think overall, yes, the, the 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 pockets there are pockets where this might be scary. There are pockets where this might be risk, and I think we need to be cognizant of them. But overall, it's a net positive momentum. That we need to keep going. Yes, we need to to be careful. We need to to address the the pitfalls as as they come along. But I think overall, I'm, I'm very very optimistic. I think it's purely not positive. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a that's a really positive way of looking at it, and kind of started <laughs> yeah. off that way and getting near the end of that. Um, do you have? Well, I, I guess we've been kind of touching on it, but like if you look to the next. I, I used to ask about 10 years, but I think 10 years is way too far out now. So over the next five years, <laughs> do, do you have a, do you have a vision? Do you have a perspective on what's going to happen? What's going to change? Like is GPT-5 going to come out and just, you know, run rampant across the economy in, in a positive way or, or negative way? Like what are your, what are your thoughts on the next five years? Yeah. Uh, five years, by the way, might be too long as well. <laughs> <laughs> At this phase, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, not, it's not, not easy to tell. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think, so I don't know exactly what the future is going to look like. If I were to, if I had to bet, I would say we would be in a multi, in a multi model future uh, where models are going to be competing quite, quite aggressively for our time and attention and engagement and inputs. Uh, I think the mo models are going to probably, well, yes, while we'll have a lot of generalized models, we'll start seeing a lot of models that are super specialized, incredibly specialized to address specific use cases. This is a great start, what we have. Um, but we're, we need more specialization. We need models that are specific towards industries or specific towards doing certain types of math and so on and so forth. I think those are already starting to pop up and will continue and, and continue to gain traction. And I think we will move probably to, to, to a place where the generic models are a platform. They, 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 they function the same way as, as hardware functions today. And then all of these apps come on top of them. All of these specializations come on top of them and allow a whole lot of new things to happen. Uh, and add an incredible amount of efficiency across the board. Now, where is it going to start and what's going to pick up steam first? I, I genuinely don't know. Um, my bet is on the on the on the overall growth. And that's that's why we focus Sapien on on supporting the growth of AI in general versus which subpart of it. Right, right. Because I know overall it's going to grow. I just don't know which part is going to grow the fastest. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, fascinating. Um, any any final thoughts? I mean, you kind of succinctly said you're, you're uh, optimistic for the future of of AI uh, and how it's going to interact with uh, with the world. Are there any kind of final thoughts that you want to leave anybody interested in technology with? Yeah, I'm 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 I'm, in, I'm incredibly optimistic. I think uh, I think uh, I think AI will get more and more embedded in more things that we do day to day. It's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I think new industries will pop up. I think new jobs and professions will pop up. I think we just we are at this period inflection point where we really need to embrace change, so that we don't get left behind. But I think it's beautiful and bright future. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a perfect way to end this. Um, Ahmed, I'll have, um, it's, it's sapien.io, right? The the website? Yes, that's uh, right. Any other places that you would like uh, people to follow you, get in touch uh, with either you or or the company? Yeah, please. Uh, LinkedIn uh, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter, uh, we're, we're on both. Perfect. Look well, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciated it. Uh, especially bringing me back to all those uh, initial episodes on automation, technological unemployment, <laughs> and the future of work. Um, good to good to rekindle that little fire. Um, <laughs> thanks for coming on, and um, yeah, really appreciate the time. Thanks a lot, Mark. Well, thanks for listening to this week's Future Tech and Foresight podcast. If you like what you've heard here, there are of course a number of ways that you can support the podcast. The best way would be to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or give a rating on Spotify, which you can find a step-by-step -step explanation for on the futuretechandforesight.com website. Alternatively, feel free to leave a comment either on the episode show notes or the YouTube channel where you can see video recordings of the interviews. And finally, if you are part of an organization that is aware of the disruptive and transformational impact that emerging and future technologies will bring and want to know more, please get in touch to hear about the strategic foresight services that we offer and how we can help future-proof your organization and take advantage of the phenomenal opportunities available to survive and thrive in the future. A lot of future shock people and future shock institutions in our society are simply overwhelmed. Once there is superintelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the superintelligence does. Science fact is catching up to science fiction. The first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention that humanity needs to make. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Within a 10-year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest and living anybody's ever known. Progress is uh, accelerating at an exponential pace and it's going to reach a point where progress is so fast it's going to be a singularity. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Every single headline points to the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization.